So I'd like to start by welcoming everyone here today in the room and online. Today's lecture is on rammed earth construction and the Kingship Ecolab Dentalog Power Project. We have the pleasure of two speakers tonight on the subject. We have Kieran Ruan, who is a chartered engineer and lecturer at the Department of Civil, Structural and Environmental Engineering at MTU. He has 30 years experience in design construction of civil engineering projects of all scales. And joining him is Sean O'Murray, design principal at Quinnip Workshop Architects, design technology studio coordinator at Cork Center for Architectural Education, UCC, since 2016, and architectural design studio tutor since 2018. Sean is author of Ireland Architecture, 200 plus buildings since 1990, and Dublin Architecture, 150 plus buildings since 1990. Sean has served as a uh, visiting guest critic to TUIDL at FAU Porto and the Royal Melbourne Institution of Technology. So I'd like to welcome both of on stage for tonight's presentation. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, you're very welcome tonight. Uh, we're delighted to see such a large crowd. I'm going to lay my notes for the first two slides uh, before I get stuck into the engineering. And uh, uh, this is our annual Ice Truckee Engineers Ireland RIA lecture. And over the years, we've had some great Ice Truckee Engineers Ireland lectures. Uh, we've had the Queen's Ferry Crossing in Edinburgh, and we've had the Shard Building, the Snyder Shard Building was over. Uh, tonight's building is kind of a different scale. In fact, you could probably fit this building in a parking space in the basement of the Shard. Uh, so there's a different scale, but also has a, well, not saying that has very interesting materials and design, and uh, there's plenty to talk about. So. Uh, the project Eco Lab results from a design build competition uh, that myself, myself and Sean entered uh, two years ago. Uh, and the competition was to build design and build an innovative structure uh, with a very modest budget of 30,000 euros. Uh, the client referred to it as a, an Eco Lab. The Eco Lab basically is a kind of a public meeting space in Tremor Valley Park, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, which could host kind of workshops for kids or small public meetings or even a place we could shelter from the rain. Um, the reason for the project from the, the, the artists in charge, which I'll talk about in a second as well, really is to promote conversation about uh, materials provenance, which is a big thing these days as we look at dealing with climate crisis, look at construction practices, and the general role that design and construction can play in alleviating or mitigating or reducing the effects of climate change. Um, so when the competition was advertised by Cork City Council, I approached on, I haven't seen the adverse, and uh, Sean really drove us on with, some, with a fantastic design. Um, but central to our ethos of the design was that we'd have as many students involved as possible. Uh, and it's fantastic to see so many students here tonight. That's kind of like we, normally our students don't listen to us, but obviously they listen to us yesterday when we were promoting the lecture. Um, and uh, you'll see some of the lectures on, on the screen, tonight, or some of the students on the, on the screen tonight. Um, so it all, it all starts here with Sean Taylor and Marilyn Lennon. And these are the artists, they're our clients for the job, really. And uh, Marilyn is an artist and uh, a colleague of ours in MTU and MTU Corporate College of Art and Design. And Sean is a lecturer and artist at Limerick, um, Limerick School of Art and Design. I'm not doing Marilyn and Sean any justice here. They're fantastic people. And if you look at their websites, lennontaylor.ie, you'll get lots of information about the type of work they do. Now, their project, they, they have a large art project uh, ongoing at the moment called the Kinship Project. Again, you'll see the, the links to that on their website. And uh, it basically, the, the, the Kinship is a collaborative project, art project set in Tremor Valley Park. Now, most of us in Corporate here in Rome would know where Tremor Valley Park is, or what it, you know, let's say what it was in the past. Certainly, those of us who are over the age of 40 uh, would remember Cork City Dump. And it's a very hard thing to think back to our childhood for those of a certain vintage. Uh, that was the landfill for the city. And when you came down the hill from the airport, you were faced with a huge you know the scale of traffic more Valley Park. Uh, that was mounds of rubbish and mounds of our bulldozers and seagulls. And uh, it was trans transformed into a, a park uh, about 10, 15 years ago uh, by my old employer, RPS and Cork City Council. Um, so the, the history of the dump actually does feed into the design, uh, the, the appearance of the structure and the, the ram dirt, the concept of ram dirt. And uh, Sean will talk more about that. Uh, in in a, in a second. Now, the Kinship, I'd urge you to look at the website and you can find out more about it. Right. So this more or less is the brief for the competition. 
Uh, it was an international competition. There was a few international people, quite a large number of people entered the competition, I think. And uh, you know, you demonstrate your kind of past experience and ideas you might have. Uh, but really, I mean, the speakers have saw it. It was only a public conversation over material dominance, construction practices, role in the greater climate change debate. And was mm -hmm. to invite architects, engineers, designers, builders uh, to help create this building, come up with some ideas. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Sean, who will say a few more about the ideas of the, the developing aesthetic. Um, so there was this idea about winning the brief about creating this meeting place, and we were interested in the idea of maybe looking back to in the past, the idea of the Agora from the Greeks. So it's kind of it's a social space where people would gather and share thoughts, and it was kind of an egalitarian space. Um, and when we went to visit the site, um, what was really interesting is, I suppose, the history that, that, that Kieran touched on the site. Well, prior to that, prior to being the municipal dump, it was actually a large um, bog within the city. And there still is a large section of bog there called Carol's Bog. Um, and it has, I suppose, a deep history. And um, for many things, it's a repository, obviously, for carbon and it's a beautiful scene place, it's an incredible place for um, wildlife, but also has a kind of a darker history because during the War of Independence, sadly, it was a place where kind of a lot of and, and a civil war where bodies were disposed of it. So there's a kind of a multi-layered history that, that, that exists there within, within the project itself. Um, but when you walked on the park and you look at a site or a site plan in a second, there was a, an opportunity, there was this one frame view of this beautiful bog, um, and we were interested in thinking about that. And then, sorry if you jump, if I jump back, there's this idea of the reeds. So it was a lot of um, things that we were kind of thinking about through the project. And it was also this idea of, you know, the meeting space historically in the, in the Irish culture was the idea of the cottage or the house. And we were interested in making this idea of a house or a place for a meeting space. And then we were, I was thinking, we were thinking about, you know, because of the reed on site, potentially thinking about the reed um, as a material for, for the project itself. Now, this is a project that here and worked on closely, so I'm going to give him a chance. <laughs> yeah, just to say a few words about it, like, you know, you, I suppose we're going to talk about Ramdirt, I mean, we haven't have explained what Ramdirt is properly yet, but like, basically it's a building built out of earth, and the uh, pre famine days in Ireland, millions and millions of people lived in uh, earth cottages, or um, all cottages like this, and uh, UCC in a very, like, a very minor involvement in this, but UCC and Ross O'Donovan in particular. Uh, in the state's office in UCC, recreated a, a famine building to celebrate, to celebrate the long work, 150 years of the famine. And uh, that was in place for three or four years. But like there is a large history of the you know, living with earth structures, uh, which we're also kind of bringing into this, this, uh, this structure here. Um, I suppose I just wanted to kind of maybe talk about Ram Dirt and that. And a lot of people are wondering, well, what is it? Um, Ram dirt is effectively where you take off the topsoil and you work with the subsoil. And effectively, you're working with the subsoil then and you're putting it into a former and it's been compacted. And there's two types of Ram dirt construction. There's stabilized Ram dirt construction where an additive is added, which may be lime or, or sometimes it's cement. Um, and then there's unstabilized where it's just simply um, art itself. And generally, in the mix that you're looking for, you're looking for around 50% um, clay, and you're looking for a fifth, and then the rest is made up of aggregate and silt and, and sands. If it's too material, is too too much clay, it can be too plastic. And I think well, Karen will go into the kind of technicalities. And then if it's too light, they don't have enough, you don't get a binding. So when the earth goes into form or particular form of way, there's a tendency for it to fall apart. So this is a building, um, and they've been working with rammed earth as a construction material for thousands of years. I mean, it's been involved in the Great Wall of China, Alhambra. It's very common in Mexico in, in warmer climates, but also in, in wetter climates like Ger in, in northern Germany. And very often in those countries, they've built up six and seven story buildings, but they'll put a lime plaster on the outside to protect the earth from um, erosion. <laughs> this is a building, a factory building in uh, Switzerland. It was designed by Herzog and Lemorne, um, and this is a large scale factory that was constructed in Ram Dirt. It was the subcontractor who built it was a company coordinated by Martin Rauch. And Martin Rauch is, I suppose, he's UNESCO professor for art, but maybe more importantly, he's actually promoted art and art construction in Central Europe over the last 40 years and really brought it back into the conversation about how we might build with art. 
So these were effectively prefabricated earth panels that were made in a factory, were lifted onto site. And then you can see the guys then were putting in the mortar and then they, they sand this back so you'd have a flush finish um, on the exterior. Very often when you're working with round dirt, you allow for erosion. So you allow for the fact that you're going to get a little bit of erosion. So sometimes the structural um, size of the walls is over, oversized to allow for um, what they call calculated erosion. And um, you can see some scale of the building here. I just leave uh, Karen to say some more with Gary. Yeah, so I think when Sean first mentioned the idea that we might look at round dirt as a possible competition entry, uh, I think I was a bit skeptical. I have to admit, I haven't heard of Ram Dirt, and um, I thought it was one of Sean's notions. That, uh, but as it turns out, after a few minutes searching, like it is, a, it is an established structural material, and it's heavily used in certain countries across Europe. And in Australia, there's loads of really detailed technical engineering literature to justify the design and the use of the material. And I just threw those, threw, threw those publications up from the, for example, the Building Research Institute. Uh, establishment in the UK has a very well-established round earth document which gives lots of guidance on selection and use and design of the material uh, as well as other other documents across the world so there's plenty of literature there and it's, it wasn't as nutty as maybe they first imagined it would be you know um there's a lot of conversations just to jump back in again we're kind of mixing it but like sometimes people say is it like the hop you mix straw into it there's no there's no additive in that regard. So with cob, you have kind of got a straw and it's a wet mix with ram dirt, it's, it's dry. Yes, you do have a little bit of moisture in it, so it, it binds. Um, but also why we were interested in the idea of this compacted piece above the ground is because all of the, as we spoke about earlier, was a municipal dump. So it's compacted landscapes so we were thinking about as well, this idea of a compacted building on the site. So this is kind of the provisional design for the plan. Obviously it references this idea with the columns and so forth, it's like Agora, it's an open space so people can gather and come through. But maybe more importantly, these two strong walls of sight is this idea of framing this uh, specific view to the bog, which you can see in the site plan here, where you get like you're walking along the path, and then this is an opportunity to actually frame this view towards the bog. Um, these were kind of renders, CGIs that were produced for the competition to kind of explain. It was this little one moment that you see in this image here where you get the bog behind this is a series of hazel trees that have grown up and it was this idea of having this structure um and then obviously with the reed roof it kind of touches on the conversation what's happening um in the bog behind this is a section through the park a lot of this park up here is actually the compacted landscape which has the, the membrane on it and beyond to the right is carl's bog which is the more natural um existing place section through the roof showing the reed Simple layer roof around dirt walls with a ring beam around. And um, these are the renders again as part of the competition, just showing this idea of the open space to allow for gatherings and meetings. And um, an axonometric just showing the structure being taken apart. And again, showing this image when you're in the space, kind of being pulled in to kind of connect with this very unusual landscape within the center of Cork City. And just share back to Karen to talk about the action. So during we got shortlisted, I suppose long story short, we got shortlisted down to three teams. We were going to three teams shortlisted. And uh it was time we had to move on to design and justify to ourselves that it would work. So before we, we entered the complete or put our final submission in, we spent uh, a few days testing our trying out materials in the lab in, in MTU. Uh, and just to give you an idea of the process, you know, uh well what we're here is we're creating cylinders of the material and then testing it. But the process basically is to take uh you know subsoil materials below the topsoil layer uh, to put the to dry out the material in uh, within reason uh, looking back to the second and uh, take the larger stones out of the uh, subsoil uh, generally stones which are greater than a half an inch are removed and uh, then basically what you do is you mix a certain amount of cement neat cement or it's ggbs cement in this case uh, back into the mix and uh, you play around with the water with the, the moisture content in the overall mix uh, and you're trying to figure out optimum cement contents, optimum moisture contents, and that type of thing. Uh, then we're basically, you know, testing samples. That's a a, 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 a cylinder of the material. And then again, prior to putting the tender in, we were making cubes and testing the cubes, and we we're finding that we were getting three four newtons strength in the material, which was ideal for what we were looking for. And uh, so that that gave us some sort of idea that we were, you know, we, we had to, if we won the competition. 
we will be able to, to build with the material uh, and build the public building with a fairly significant roof structure on it and wind loading all the rest of it. Uh, so we were delighted at that point and put in the, the, the tender and we won the competition. And, uh, you know, there was a lot more materials testing to be done. Uh, I mentioned earlier, it was always one of our key aspects of the project that we would get as many students as possible involved. Uh, the time scale worked out quite nicely that uh, we were able yeah. to get one of our final year master students uh, in and involved and allowed uh, to base his, his final year thesis on the project. And this is Conrad here. Conrad's in the audience there somewhere. They're in the middle, right, on the back as usual. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so Conrad did an awful lot of the work in the lab, in the lab doing the, the form of testing of the materials for the construction stage. Uh, which uh, And a lot of the uh, results I'm going to present now uh, come from Conrad's thesis. So just a brief, 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 brief recap, like, you know, those of us who were a little bit of road injuring back in the day, kind of finding up with this kind of curve. Um, so, you know, you play, you play any soil mixture and you play around with the moisture content, just sort of like an optimal moisture content to give you the kind of maximum uh, density of the soil. And that's what you really want to achieve when you're using your earth sensor material for construction, whether it be a road embankment, ground dirt wall, or whatever. Now, the top of the curve can be a bit flat, so there's a range of maybe like typical moisture contents in the soil, in fact, optimum might be in the range 12, 14, 15%, that kind of range. So it does depend, depending on your soil, if your soil is mostly sandy, silty, or clay, and the optimum moisture contents fairly accordingly. And those of us who worked in roads jobs over the years, you know, a lot of, there's not an awful lot of moisture contact uh, condition testing and all the rest of it to get the optimum compaction for the, uh, the road magnet. So the type of stuff we were doing in the lab with Conrad, lots of particle size distribution curves to figure out what's the nature of the soil we're using. And then doing a more really systematic strength testing and developing the materials uh, for the project and, and testing materials as the project was progressing as well. So the, the testing involves, you know, making these cylinders of the material uh, putting in this happens to be our, our concrete cube testing machine in the lab. Um, so what you can see there is you've got RCTR cylinder, you've got hydraulic jack, you've got a load cell for measuring the load, and you've got a displacement gauge as well. Just keep my displacements. And what you're trying to achieve is some sort of failure, which is what seems to be a satisfactory failure, and that that's an extract from the uh, the Euro norm for testing of concrete cylinders, right? And uh, you know, typically we're our, our, our cylinders were failing it, it, with the lateral cracks on the right hand side there, uh, and it's kind of slow failure. Like so, you know, it would build up the strength, and then it would, it would it would laterally expand and lose a bit of the strength, but it hold its own for a while. So the type of testing that Conrad was doing for his, his thesis then was to just kind of play around with, uh, like so for this case in this slide here, uh, holding the cement contents at twenty percent, and then playing around with the moisture content. 25%, 20%, 15%. Now, so you can see, you know, as you reduce the moisture content down towards the optimum level, uh, you're getting an optimum strength as well. And you can see that, like, those cylinders, that body there is peaking out there around 72 kilonewton or seven tons, so seven tons sitting on the cylinder. Um, we we're at a design level that's typically around 20% cement, 15% moisture, give or take. That gives a failure over there about 44 kilonewtons, four ton, give or take. And that would equate to a yield or a kind of compressive strength of 2.5 newtons per millimeter squared. It sounds quite low, all right? But the walls are 500 mil thick. And, uh, you know, when you when you work it all out uh, and you allow, say, an allowable uh, stress of 1 newtons per millimeter squared in the walls, that gives you the capacity in the walls. We'll see in a second of about 500 kilonewtons or 50 ton per meter, which is more than enough for the self weight of the structure, the roof structure, which is tied onto the walls, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and wind loading and all the rest of it. So it's by mass, it's it's withstanding it's, itself. Other test then is, you know, this is increasing the, the holding the moisture content at a certain level, 20 cents in this case, and then filling up the cement content. And you can see the mass step up when you build up the cement. But that, the drawback to that then is that you're, the nature of your failure then in, in the large testing, it goes from a kind of a slow yield, kind of, yield we would, would be right now, but a kind of slow kind of expansion failure to an explosive failure. So there, there's drawbacks. Yeah, well, I'll talk about some of the, I'll start off talking about construction and I'll hand over to Sean in a second. So moving on to site then, you know, on site, and this is all the work done was voluntary, right? So we, we, did, we did a very limited budget, 31,000 euros to deliver this. And um, so you know, basically, our normal reinforced concrete foundations for structure and some starter barriers, 
we want to lift the standards of above ground level and start off with kind of a concrete flint and concrete based uh, columns, um, and then former construction uh, again, all voluntary by friends of the team, basically. Um, the form of construction you can use to from concrete construction. Um, in fact, this is concrete construction as, as our flint, and then a layer of mud seal on top just to give a little bit of moisture protection at the bottom. If you know, want to, probably not necessary, but we put it in anyway. Um, and maybe at this point, I'll hand over to Sean to talk about the construction process in more detail. I think the critical thing is when you're working with earth, you always want to keep the water away from it because when water gets to something, you can break it down, obviously. That's why maybe typically with in historical buildings, they might have built stone plinths. We didn't have the, I suppose, the opportunity or the budget. So in this case, we have to use a 50% GGBS concrete, which is the most environmental seamed system we could use. Um, I'm just showing some images of the former here. This is where we have to have some fun. Um, so again, it's not this idea that we didn't have kind of plant machinery, so we kind of almost have to be inventive. So when we got the piles of earth or the subsoil, we're kind of looking at ways of how do we, um, you know, take out the organic matter because you can't have any organic matter like weeds or roots or so forth. You can't have any large stones. We found from the testing the lab, the optimum size stone was around 14 mil. So anything bigger than that gave us was going to give us issues. So we developed this kind of system. Actually, all of us kind of having conversations about how we might on site. So it's Jerry, Daniel, and Eamon, who's here tonight, looking at different ways about how you might grade the earth. And we kind of, after a while, I nicknamed this, this, this contraption the man eater because you put someone on it for a day and they didn't come back after that. <laughs> um, but anyway, so we were grading the earth, getting through it. And when it's graded, it's incredible. It's like this kind of almost like a beautiful sand. Um, and here, what you have on the right hand side are the rammers. And I was chatting with one of the students here earlier on, he was saying he was getting post traumatic stress disorder, seeing these uh, image coming up because it's supposed to, with the ramming, there's an optimum weight, which has been found historically, and that's been six kgs is the optimum. Because when you're doing this for you know six hours, it has our seven or eight hours on site, it has a kind of an impact. Um, on that kind of is for the compaction of the earth, and also it's 100 mil plate, 100 mil size surface area, which is like um four inches, which is, has been found to be, again, and this is kind of throughout history in different books that we've looked at um, historically in terms of the material. So you can see there where we started doing the shutter work um, and the first, I suppose, layer of compaction of the earth. When you compact the material, generally you get a three is to two ratio. So when you put a material in, it just gets compacted down um, to such so, so generally you might get you know, if you did 100, it'd be just just maybe around 66 or 65 millimeters of compacted earth. Um, what you're looking for as well is, I suppose, critical to actually putting the earth into the, the form of itself is that you want to make sure that when the earth goes in, it can have, for different reasons, depending on the, the climatic conditions of the day, there could be a high moisture content, so it could be kind of balls, you have to kind of break down the balls with your feet or grind them. Um, critical as well as obviously just like any farmwork is making sure that it's um, there's enough release agent on the farmwork so that, that you know when you're taking off the farmwork that it doesn't pull away the earth and sides um, and then you can actually see the compaction of the actual um, the earth inside in, in the farmwork itself so it's literally what you do is you walk across it um, and you compact it down with your fingers and then what we do is something called a soft ram where you lift it up and you just slowly compact the ram into place or the earth into place. Um, and what I found or noticed is actually from the students that were working on the project, it's really interesting. And it's, it's an interesting sort of observation that students who tended, we were talking earlier on that in first year architecture in the school, we always teach the students to draw by hand. So in the first year, all by kind of analog systems. Mm -hmm. uh, or by hand. And then what we found is actually the students that came on were tended to be the best drafters as well, that they had the best control um, which you'd never think of for this kind of really heavy object, and then kind of collaboration with that. But if I think we can play this here, um, this gives you kind of a sense of so this is the soft ram, so you can see it like this, and then compact into layers, and then after that, then you come back and do a heavy ram, and then you're lifting it about 150 mil above and dropping it down, lifting it up, dropping it down, lifting it up, dropping it down. And you can see that you fill that up in there as you go across and um, right across the piece itself. Also, actually, within compaction of art, and something I forgot about, 
there's a lot of things that, you know, there's a lot of uh, intuitive things when you're working with Earth. So when Earth is compacted, it has a really hollow sound. When it when it's not when it's still soft here, you can see it's it's getting it has a more high tone pitch. Also, when you have Earth with sub sub, you know if you've got a good Earth content or clay content, if you ball the Earth and you get a you ball it together in your hand, if it if it, you don't have the optimal uh, clay content, it will break in your hand there. Also, if you've got too much clay, you can actually keep rolling it. It's called a sausage where it keeps rolling. So then you've got too much clay and you need to add in um, kind of a mix, either of an aggregate or sand to balance out the amount of clay in, in the mix itself. Um, this are some images of the farm work. Um, those of you who have done a lot of shuttering and farm work, um, you're probably aware of the kind of slip farm shuttering. So this is like where you have shuttering here and it's slipped up through these jigs. But um, we were under a lot of like a lot of that slip form shop form of using large scale panels um, or a docker system in, in metal. And obviously we were building this all on site. But when I presented the construction system to our carpenter, Eamon, he had this idea where actually we bring the form up down and into a small section and then slip it up through these grids. So you know, these long walls that we lifted by ourselves on site and lifted up and just screwed in two fixed panels at the end. So it was a really kind of, I suppose, clever move to kind of refine how you might make something when you don't have a good budget on site to kind of maybe facilitate larger scale construction. This is just the compaction again. These are the layers as it's coming up. You can see concern there when we did the first layer, there was kind of some sort of slight cracks. And I think maybe what was happening is that, you know, there was different days between the form where we were ramming and I found afterwards it's every day we have to kind of make sure that we had the shutters oil to make sure when we were putting it up that we get a clean release um, on the form itself. You can see here as well, there's a slight crack across the surface of the earth. Again, that came when we bought the earth, the, this final compaction layer, we found that the earth was kind of forming the meniscus on the on the form and it was coming up. So then when we pulled the form up, we were actually pulling away the top layer. And when we realized that actually what you need to do every time you go up is to cut the top layer off. So it's all flush and flush. So when you're pulling the former, you don't get this um, erosion away when you're when you're pulling the former away. Um, this is obviously just the, the leaching from the, from the cement from the carbonate, and this is the structure for the roof. I think if you want to, yeah, yeah. So just to, I suppose back to the structural aspects of the project as well. You know, so obviously it's quite a, a large roof and structure which has to be tied to the walls to avoid it taking off. Um, so maybe about 600 mm down from the top, uh, we put in stainless steel anchors uh, and then continue to ramming up so we, like when we were finished, we had uh, basically a series of tight tread rods uh, to tie the roof down. Now you can see the, the columns in a second. Uh, the columns of the structure are quite discreet as well. Like now, particularly around Earth, it is kind of susceptible to vandalism, you know, if you had a German vandal, uh, they could decide to hack away over a weekend at a wall or something like that. You know, wouldn't be great, but be more serious for a column. Um, so I think early on in the process, we did decide that we were going to uh, have a central steel box section in the columns for anti-vandalism, but also to just further tie down the roofing system uh, onto, the, onto the foundations and you know, to make sure it's, it's windproof and whatnot. I hope it's still windproof. I haven't been out to see it since last Sunday. So uh, we have done anything to do otherwise not. Um, and then the other aspect of the kind of the, the structural aspect of the the system is, and we shall look at these slides in seconds. Obviously, the roof's kind of high pitching us, and the roof would kind of come down and look to push out the walls. Uh, so the roof actually has a tie beam uh, at each level uh, to try and get, well, basically to contain all the lateral pushing forces and to minimise the outward push on the walls. Uh, now the walls are grand and taken. If it, they have a large enough cross section to keep your stresses low, but uh, between the tie lungs and the tie beam, that really was the, the structural aspects, trying to tie the roof onto the structure uh, with a degree of comfort for the engineer and the architect as well. So. This is a great photograph of an engineer inspecting the wall. <laughs> um, has a beautiful material quality the, the earth itself you know when it got like it's it's, it's one thing that it, it sort of changes with the seasons in the summertime it gets really dry and almost has a dusty feeling and in the winter time it absorbs the water and kind of darkens and it's, it wasn't really responds to the environmental conditions under which 
today is, and this is, I suppose, when we keep the taking down all the former, you can see, I suppose, with the lines and the date, you know, as we got to the top, maybe we should, we learned from our first one that we were kind of maybe having too much pressure at the top of pushing out, we should reinforce more, and that's why it's kind of bulging slightly at the top there, but I guess in, in overall, we were happy given it was our first major wall to make. Here you can start to see the, the beauty, or if you're involved in the construction, the pain, I don't know uh, which side you look at, but each one of these is around 75 mil, um, and these layers, and this was like a morning session, this was an afternoon session, morning session, and afternoon session. To come up one of these layers, which is about 150 millimeters, it's approximately a week's work for three or four people between grading the earth, getting it, it sorted, then putting it in, uh, tampering it over weekends, um, until you got the final layer. So there was a lot of, I suppose, labor involved. And I suppose we're I'm very grateful to all the volunteers. Some of them are here today, Sean, James, um, Michael, um, and Paul was here, Mick. I mean, some of them couldn't be here, but uh, thank you so much to everyone who's involved. Uh, Dara, uh, Connor, I'm forgetting anyone's names, I apologize, and Owen, um, who are, and Kate and Daniel, were very much involved in construction and, and we're, we're super grateful for all of that. This is where we started with the columns. Um, if I'm honest, I wasn't quite sure how we were going to make the columns. I am um, again to sit form shutter work, but this is all easy to say, but you know, it's this idea of how we're going to keep the, the columns straight and how um, we're going to work it. And I suppose we were really grateful again to be working with Eamon, who's an incredible carpenter, who enabled us to, I suppose, had a balance, brought up the form work, kept it all level. I don't know quite how he did it because he got into the columns each time, pulled it up, leveled it with it the level uh, and made everything um, straight. And I'm not still unsure how it was done, given that I could only probably lift one sheet at a time. He can lift two on his own. I don't know. You can see the context here with the columns. So it's coming up and then you can, this is kind of, maybe it's kind of slightly a little bit derelict and getting overgrown, but you can kind of see what the initial idea was when you're walking in the park and this idea of the framed direct view into the bog that's the only kind of aspect or opportunity when you're on this long pathway where that is framed. Um, and really what we're trying to get to the idea is pulling people in to kind of engage with this very unusual landscape within the city. You see, put down the hardcore for the floor. The ambition of the floor is that the final finish on the floor will be hogging. Um, if anyone isn't familiar with that, hogging is an art and stone mix, gravel mix. And it would have been typical on the, the roads of Cork, or the streets of Cork, like Patrick Street and, and historically, before I suppose the development of Tarn Academy, we often get hogging in kind of manor houses, um, which, which would be used for pathways and so forth, kind of a mix of earth and binding. So that is the final floor finish. Sorry, the earth will go on top of the compacted clause. This is back to the ring beam again. Do you want to? No, I think actually. Yeah. Right. So um, just showing the column, the ring beam that's going along, tie downs for the ring beam, um, and the structure itself is this coming through here. Should note as well that the actual form of the roof itself is defined by the material. So you might think that there's quite a steep pitch. It's the minimum pitch for thatch. So the proposed roof is an, a reed roof. Um, obviously with thatch, there's different types of thatch from straw to reed and oat. Um, and it's really interesting how, you know, it's not that long ago that we were all kind of living in, potentially in these structure or this scale and type of structure or in, and format. And it was only through this project that I found out that even my mother herself was born in an earth-based house, which had a thatched roof because my aunt was down to visit and she said, oh, Kate, your mother was born and I, and I never knew this and she didn't know herself. So it's funny that we're all somehow connected to, I suppose, this ideology of construction and methodology. This is kind of seeing the form of the roof with the hips going on. And um, again, great work by Eamon. And you can see, I suppose, in the context, we're still, we're awaiting the thatcher. I suppose if you're aware of patchers today, they're such a rare um, skill and craft. I think there's only two, bunk, or maybe two, three patchers actually working in Cork. A lot of them are booked out for 18 months to two years. Um, so fingers crossed our thatcher is coming um, in March. Um, and we're very grateful for him to be coming. He's a master thatcher. The man is nearly 70 now, but he's incredible. Um, he's incredible skills. So. It'll be a great spectacle to see that. In a strange way, this is just showing the reeds on the hill, or sorry, the grass on the hill. And I think when it's attached, it'll somehow sort of you know, tie in with the landscape in that regard there. You might be wondering why I'm showing a photograph of the River Lee. Um, 
I suppose this is, I suppose, a consequence of the, the amount of phosphates that are coming into our rivers. Um, and it's a it's a challenge that, that I suppose, the, the state faces. But thankfully, through, I think it's this year, I only, only found out that EU law does a, it, it become, I suppose, the, the quantity and levels of phosphates that are going into rivers would be regulated for the first time um, because it's causing a huge challenge. And I suppose the context here is that Irish weed, unfortunately, because of the amount of phosphates that are going to rivers, it's not fit for purpose. So regrettably, the reed that has to be used on the roof um, is a Turkish-based reed because the Irish reed, even though it might look aesthetically appropriate, after almost maybe a year or two, it'll disintegrate. It's the, the central core of stalks and don't have the same malleability or strength um, for, and unfortunately, they don't, like if, if it was to be adopted or used in, on the structure, it wouldn't um, be applicable. So I suppose it's just a broader conversation about how we're looking at our environment and how we're treating our landscape. Um, and that's something I suppose that we need to, I suppose, be aware of. And that's, I suppose, part of the broader conversation. And this is the final slide. Um, um, and you might wonder why we're showing this, but again, it, I suppose it goes back to the original idea about this idea of a meeting space and gathering space. Um, and this is the central image from, central hall image from Vermont House, which is now is a room, which is just overlooking the site in Tremor Valley, Valley Park. Um, and this is the central place, Colonnade, which was a place, the idea of a kind of meeting space for ideas to be discussed and for social issues to be engaged with. And again, I suppose it, it goes back to that this, kind of space was in the locality previously and you know in a, which i wasn't aware of but only for the project we found it um and i suppose maybe hopefully when the project is completed that will kind of re-engage and we might have that opportunity again for this meeting space in the park itself um that's our final slide i'd like to say thanks to everyone for attending and i'll hand it over to the chair again <laughs> I suppose I'd just like to open it to the floor straight away for any questions. Um, but we'll start on the floor, and if anyone online has any questions, uh, please type it into the uh, Q&A uh, box um, within the Zoom function. So uh, we'll start here in the room. Is there any questions? <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll start with one, I suppose. Um, just in relation to the construction process itself and the effect water might have on it, and I suppose with our climate, how did you yeah. find and how did you juggle that? Yeah, but we would, you know, the, the, I was mentioning the, the early part of the talk here that like, we may have optimal moisture content maybe around 15%. In reality, 12 to 18, 19% actually was fine, you know. And uh, the soil actually, when you're grading and you're going to get out to dry, like we're getting even through typical road construction projects, you'd often let the soil uh, dry out in the atmosphere. Um, so that that's the compaction side of the moisture contents. Then when the wall is built, the moisture content is naturally varying on a wet day and all the rest of it. Uh, and that's fine too. It's not unlike a concrete wall which, where the moisture is passing through and all the rest of it. Um, and what you actually find with the round earth as we've observed it now, it's like we finished running probably in September, do we or uh, well it was maybe July or August of July August. Sorry, sorry. March April for the columns and sides. Yeah, the, the, the wall, the last wall is in the feathers. Yeah, so actually, yeah, so the longer I thought, actually, so we, like, we, we have been observing it over time. Like, what you find with the Rambert as constructed is that on a hot day, and Sean mentioned this, you can get a bit of dust loss and, and it looks a, a bit more, it looks friable, obviously. Uh, but on a wet day, and you see on a wet day, it, it actually almost strengthens itself with the with the moisture, you know. So, it's it, like once you get your moisture content reasonably okay when you're constructing and ramping the material, and thereafter, there's a, a curing that goes on with the cement, obviously. And thereafter, then again, it, it reacts very well to the moisture. It almost likes living in a wet environment, from what I can see on it. First of all, it's there almost a year and a half now, and it's really solid. And I actually anticipated no erosion on the wall. And um, so, so far, so good. Very good. Uh, just going online there, uh, Ian McCarthy has asked, what is the expected design like on walls and columns? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually asked the structure is a temporary structure officially. That was the fine brief and the fine to envisage the structure for five years, I think. But in our own heads, we see a longer lasting structure here. You know, and the, the design guides would say that it, 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 if you build around dirt, you'll reach the kind of 60 year design life that, that's kind of entrenched in the Eurocodes for uh, everyday building design. 
And uh, I think as Sean had mentioned earlier as well, like they, we design for a certain amount of material loss over time. You know, so, it, so to answer your question, the structure, our own structure has, has that notion of a five-year design. I, I suspect that we'll, it will be there as long as it's, it's, long, it's yeah. serviceable, hopefully. Uh, and then the other part of the question, you, you know, you're using ground dirt as an official construction material, like they do a lot, a lot in Australia and places, uh, they expect to get 60 years old. But... Their ground dirt structure in Central Europe are 200 years old, you know, and they'll have a line around there, so they're, they're still standing. And that's a good point, actually, because, you know, we have an option here as well of putting a line render, for example, a whitewash line render on, on this building if you want us, that can help promote the longevity of the, the structure material, you know. So. Question for... Um... So it's from an arch architect's perspective, so just absolutely Sean, it's fantastic. But how viable a construction method is it? Because we're living in an age now where it's all about air tightness, concrete blocks, modern technology. Here is something that came off the ground, you know, and can go back into the ground. It's fascinating, but could you see it in a domestic situation? You could have a client might have a round dirt house and it's taken on the bills, and that sort of viability I'm very interested in. It's so different, the air tightness and everything we're now learning about. Well, well, I suppose just to go back to that, there are round dirt houses, and it's very common to have them in the States and in Australia. I think primary challenge is associated with the cost. There's just so much work involved in the labour. But in terms of air tightness, yes, I mean, you might have a round dirt aesthetic on the outside, you still, still have a line render finish on the inside, or your central walls would have a right uh, around dirt finish. So certainly there is no concern in terms of contenting it. I think the challenge is, is financial as opposed to the action. But I think there's a, a big conversation about this project came about the idea of like taking materials from the ground locally, all this earth to source in Van Hassig um, um, and around Shetland. And the idea is that like you know, historically we have hundreds of brick factories in Cork and we're getting all the material locally and we're building locally. And it just I think it's just a conversation about carbon and how we use carbon. And I think that, that's probably the stronger conversation. I think that I think we come into play when when we have to do more carbon calculations on buildings and to justify their viability. Yeah, just to add to that, I'm actually working in a cottage at the moment, a cast cottage, and um, it has mud walls in it. And you can actually see in the land near the cottage where the mud was cut from. Right. And this building is 200 years old and will eventually go back into the ground again. I think that's, that's you can't get greener than that. So that's what maybe we're hoping for one day with this, but hopefully after our lifetime with this building. But actually, as you mentioned, like, you know, the, the you know the artists, the client artists, Sean and Marilyn, they, they envisage that they wanted to they wanted to maybe get builders involved in something that would promote conversation or get people talking about different materials and even the conversation like is this realistic for a house in Ireland? That's exactly what the 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 artist vision was on, on the project as well. Fascinating presentation. Congratulations to both of you. One question do you see it as being Kind of me, as the opposite is, you know, you're 100 by 100, they are 66 kg. Do you see any commercial way of making the pieces or making blocks or yeah, I'm not sure I'm stuff, but that you we see the Australian yeah. guys doing this, they're allowed on site and they allow pneumatic compactors, so they won't have an army of students to do this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So you can do it, you can increase the productivity which on you when you stuff like this. There are building buildings, six-story buildings in France and around there with walls, but it's all prefabricated, just like we saw there. So that building we looked at was prefabricated, so we're making the sections in factory. I think it's the challenges that we were talking about earlier about moisture and you know, wet climate. If, if it's too the earth is too wet, it's, it goes into mud, and then you can't compact it. It's got a really challenge we had on, on a lot of days where we couldn't work. Um, so to answer your question, it's, it's certainly being explored a lot more in Central in Europe now, and maybe your construction with these prefabricated panels for assembled on site. And, and, and it would be interesting to see does it, does it do we have the opportunities here? Because certainly a lot of it happened in France and Belgium and Austria and at the moment. So the building walls and fire to store it. What, what sort of thickness of the walls? Are there? It's a really good question. I can send you all the information. I have actually books that have been on. I know it's about around six or seven hundred you know, wide walls. This is five hundred. Probably didn't need to be that thick. Could probably be three hundred, but you know, but probably say a calculated erosion. I anticipated more erosion on the walls. We haven't had it. If I'm honest, it's probably five hundred thick as well for protection from vandalism. Like it was concerned, but. I tell you a funny story when we were rounding the walls and the James here and a few others that were involved in the last round. And the first wall, 
we went beyond so you have markers on the lines the form of where we got them got to the top part and we actually went over the line it was late in the evening time and we lost the, the darkness we went above it and took on the form and said i can't believe this we actually had more of a response to this i had to come back the next day with steel and try to take off i was there for hours trying to hitting it and it's really it became really hard so it's just interesting that it's it's a lot harder than I anticipated it would be. And I suppose the time to be pure can become even harder. But in Central Europe, and a lot of like Ralph doesn't use a stabilizer. He, when I say stabilizer, it's cement the line. He just used pure art compacted and then like start in Germany, they put a line running around it to protect it. So it protects from the erosion. It's the erosion is the big thing, really, with, with, with driving rain and you know, and what that what impact that could potentially have. And with having a stabilizer. In this case, cement it, it uh, mitigates that. Yeah, just on that, um, Mark Murphy said, look, extremely um, interesting talk here. I mean, Sean Kieran you mentioned vandalism as a potential threat in relation to wind erosion of the material. But how much do you over design the wall to allow for this? And is it possible to calculate rate erosion rate per year? Yeah, well, I suppose, uh, thanks, Mark. The um, couple of things there, I suppose, we, we see the project as it stands as kind of a live. Durability study anyway in Lambert will be lined up for the next few years. Um, it's like we've over designed, like for example, the working stresses in the wall are very low. Like you could, as Sean said, you could probably live with a 300 mil wall in actual fact. Um, so it, it, it's hard to answer what, what kind of rate of erosion we're expecting, other than the fact that it's less than we think at the moment. Anyway, you know, and plus, we haven't had any issues, I don't think, with vandalism yet. No issues with vandalism, no issues with erosion. And it's, as I said, the first wall, is, and the first wall is southwest facing, so it's getting it's getting battered from the rain and the wind. So, like the other built, and that's the, that one's excluded. Like the other big worry about the building from a vandalism point of view is just the attached roof. That, that might be, people might be trying to say, you know, they might draw a match on it or whatever, you know. Now, that is a concern with all attached structures, um, but. We have sourced a kind of a, a bio-friendly, eco-friendly fire retardant for the attach. Um, but look, unfortunately, you kind of have to do your best to design against vandalism. But in reality, it's impossible to fully vandal proof a public structure, unfortunately. You know? And with the attach, is the attach, you know, when it over time does it become in itself? Does it kind of is it on in plan or kind of to, to a degree? Sean, we're going to come on that, I would say. Um, it's just depending on how dry it is. It's like anything, actually, it's like straw bale. You know, when you put a fire to straw bale, because it's so compact so much, it doesn't want it. It's, it's actually the noose. So it may almost be pulled out and then it's just going to compact it. It's not, you don't have the surface area and oxygen to, to get that reaction. Uh, another question there um, from Kevin. And I know you have mentioned the lime render. A very interesting talk. Thank you. Is it necessary to seal the surface of interior in any way, or is there a historic precedent for sealing it? So I know you mentioned long windows, both of them another form. You could potentially put a transparent, um, but I'm not aware it's just a product. We kind of just allowed for the erosion to happen and part of the aesthetic suppose, of it. You know, it's kind of evolving structure. It sounds like a strange thing, but it's kind of almost like an evolving structure in itself. You know, it's, yeah, I think it's an equal lab and the lab, yeah, the lab art is, and that's the lab experiments really that part of the conversation of, of the building. I and mean, I suppose that's that's interesting that it'll create that conversation, hopefully. But there are the liquid applied sealants you put on these walls, makes them a bit more water resistant. You could potentially apply that to round earth as well. But we'll kind of go against the ethos of the building as well, I think. I suppose putting the synthetic material on to yeah. it, like you kind of want to leave it without it. Um, and also it might put a sheen on it. And it's 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 got a beauty in its, itself as it is quite um Eamon asks uh, do you have a record of the number of man hours it took to build a rat <laughs> <laughs> you, you probably I, I still have trauma on my arm <laughs> um no seriously um, no it didn't keep it but it was uh as we were saying for the lifts it was approximately five meters i was taking nearly 40 hours maybe 70 hours but come up 300 millimeters on the five meter stretch of wall that's because we were literally the other thing we were grading all of the earth with you know with wheelbarrows and you know if you're doing this on a larger scale you'd need machinery to grade the earth um and then you'd have a loader you'd be loading the earth into steel and then you'd have pneumatic rammers and it would be a lot more if you're doing it like that or alternatively you do it inside a factory um so we were kind of doing it kind of the egyptian method you know um brian cotter a uh, great presentation uh why not add a 
matrix material to increase the compressive and shear strength to reduce the thickness and increase the height um, horse hair used to be added to limitals in the past, for example. 100%. Yeah, we definitely do that. I think we were, we were down to the kind of pure round dirt or the same pure rat stabilized round dirt rules, but certainly horse hair and binders they that are often used for these materials. Next project. <laughs> Next project. <laughs> and uh, Kyle asks any concerns about rainwater erosion on the tops of the walls and columns while there is no roofing on? They're sealed with they're, the. They're, they're sealed, so we have, um, there's a ring beam around it, and we put shelf on the ends, cover protected water waiting for the patch to come, so it's temporarily protected to the top. And uh, finally, online, Michal asks in relation to the question about air tightness, etc., while the carbon emissions of a modern construction methods and the materials include this traditional, traditionally might actually come much better overall. Question would in relation to that. Do you want to talk about air tightness? Sorry, was this specific air tightness? Yeah, so in, in relation to the question about air tightness, etc., while the carbon emissions of a modern, modern construction methods and material is included, this traditionally might actually come much better overall. Like, would you find that the, there'd be better air tightness, I suppose, when you do the need, the way to get, what well, I'm, I'm trying to interpret it, you know, as you tend to saying that um, with all the modern construction and all the requirements, you know, that the carbon emissions that are used to get the, to that air tightness oh, from an overall point of view, yeah. would you get a better result with the with the earth walls? I think there's, I mean, it's tough look. Problems, where is the material coming from? I think the critical thing that's not, I mean, you look at Ireland, you look at the west coast of Ireland, all stone buildings traditionally, east coast, there's an awful lot of earth structures, neat, loud, and um, they would have built them historically. They've been recorded actually by the Trinity College Engineering Department. So I'm just definitely, I mean, it's all about the sourcing of materials close by to reduce carbon and output. And um, is there any more questions from the floor? Yeah. How would you go about repairing the structure of the piece of the floor? It's a really good question. This has actually happened for building a um, large scale round earth house in England at present, um, and they haven't used any stabilizer because of the amount of rain. So, what you do is you actually, if you get pockets out, you can actually, it's almost a bit faster to put in and kind of with, with, a, with a binder or something with, with her parser potentially. And it's, I think it's polished back. Not dissimilar to the round earth structure that we saw in um, Austria when you had the large blocks and then there's the gaps between the blocks to fill it in with a kind of an earth based mortar and then they can sand it all back to make it flush. So that's what they do when they have that. And that's, that can happen, obviously, you know, if you've got a conversion. In a, a six or a seven story hall, there's a main round earth, but the round earth walls themselves be strong. So so Martin Roke, so this man, Martin Roke, who really, I mean, he is the celebrated person for round earth construction. He came to Cork in 2011 to talk about his round earth. So round earth. Martin Roke's company built this factory in Switzerland. And the first slide he showed was this eight story building, and which is completely built in round, you know, had a line render protected. And it was over 20, and it was kind of almost up. We've been, this building has been standing for 200 years. Um, and that was kind of the because first thing that everyone responds to when you can build out of earth is going to fall down. It's just, you know, our, our brains and condition in a particular way, but there's it's still family, so there is that potential to use it, you know, use it into But you can we start using a combination with a, a structural skeleton for sure, you know. Mm -hmm. In which case then the walls primarily become a whole their own self-way and the winds transfer into the frame, you know. Any more questions? So um, look, I suppose on behalf of everyone here, I would like to thank Sean and Kieran for a very informative and interesting presentation on round earth construction, and in particular the Dentala project, um, I suppose from the brief to completion. Um, it was great to see the way the building tied into the landscape and sat in the site and how that was achieved at the start. And I suppose the detail showing the path to deciding the final material um, via the testing that uh, Conrad undertook really highlighted the degree of work that took, was undertaken prior to um, even going to site. And um, look, it, it was a very detailed account of the construction, and I was very impressed by the degree of volunteer work involved, and dare I say, the passion and patience that was involved in the project. And um, I think there's definitely an opportunity for a return lecture practice um, in a couple of years' time to see how the project is 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 going and what 
what um, issues have occurred or deems um, what the outcomes have been for, for the material. Um, so again, look, I would like to thank Sean and Kieran again for delivering such a presentation. And finally, look, it's great to see engineers and architects work so well together. So <laughs> and again, I'd like to a round of you.